Hi guys, you may think that all surveys are the same, but there are actually quite a number of possibilities. You will need to work through a key issues before you can determine which will best suit you and your research agenda. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the different types of surveys used for research. Now, as a research supervisor, I have certainly found survey construction to be the activity most underestimated in terms of difficulty and not just by students even professional researchers have a hard time getting it right so let's see what are the different types of surveys that you can use for your research so that you can choose the right one for your research agenda the first type of survey for this first type can be classified under will your survey simply describe or attempt to explain under this category, I will take up two main types of surveys. One is a descriptive survey and the other is what you call an explanatory survey. So what is a descriptive survey? Descriptive surveys, uh, the goal is to get a snapshot or to describe your respondents by gathering the demographic information. Uh, demographic information refers to age, socioeconomic status, gender, personal information, for example, political opinion or use of illegal drugs, uh, information regarding attitudes, for example, attitude towards greenhouse gas emissions or healthcare cost. So an example of a descriptive survey can be political polling, which attempts to describe the voters intentions. An example that you can see on your screen, of course. Then we have the explanatory surveys. The explanatory surveys gather descriptive data but they also establish cause and effect to figure out why things might be the way they are. For example, a recent Australian survey collected data describing attitudes to the Iraq conflict, as well as data used to establish what might shape and form those attitudes. For example, personal experiences or familial attitudes or political leanings, so on and so forth. The second type of survey will be classified under the fact whether you plan to sample or ask everyone in your population. So under this category, we have two types of surveys, a census or a cross-sectional survey. So let's find out what each of them are with the use of examples. A census is a survey that does not rely on a sample. It normally covers every single person in a defined population. I'm sure if you have uh, been living in a country for too long, I'm sure you have undergone a census survey. So any census survey in any country finds out who lives in your family, how many people are there, what is their age, what do they do, are they employed, so on and so forth. Then you have the cross-section surveys that use a sample or actually a cross section of the respondents to represent a target population. Here the goal is to be able to generalize findings. So most surveys actually fall under this category. For example, you may have a community survey that targets only one in every 10 households, but it still aims to represent the entire community. The third category of survey will be classified under will you survey over a period of time? And if so, do you want to explore changing times or changing people? So under this category also, I will put two surveys. One is a trend survey and the other is a panel study. So let's find out what each of them are. A trend survey normally asks the same cross section. So similar group of respondents, the same questions at two or more points in time. The goal here is to see if classifications of individuals have changed over time. So let me give you an example. So an example would be that, let's say you are conducting a three phase survey conducted over a 20 year period. So let's say you did one survey in 1986, then 1996 and then 2006. So from 1986 to 2006, you have 20 years away. And you are asking newlyweds their attitude towards marriage. So the goal will be to see if their attitudes of the newlyweds in the new millennium are the same as the attitudes of the newlyweds from 1980s to 1990s. So you are kind of doing a trend survey to see how the trend has changed. In this case, how the trend has changed uh, in terms of attitudes towards marriage. 
Then we have the panel study. A panel study, what it involves is asking the same, not similar, but the same sample of respondents, the same question at two or more points in time. And the goal here is to see if individuals themselves have changed over time. So if you use the same example as I used before, where you surveyed newlyweds in 1986, then you would survey the same individuals in 1996, 10 years after their marriage, and then again in 2006 in order to assess the attitude shift as individuals get older. So did you get the difference between panel study and trend study? So in panel study, you are asking the same individuals, the same questions, but over a period of time to see if they have changed. But in trend study, you are asking the same questions, but to different individuals with similar characteristics over a period of time to see if the trend has changed, the attitude has changed or not. All right. But here you have to see whether the individuals have changed or not. The final category of surveys will be classified under how you plan to administer your survey. So under this, I have put face to face surveys, telephone surveys and self administered surveys. So face to face surveys, as you probably know, you know, they are the ones you conduct face to face where you can see the individuals, meet the individuals. Uh, you can probably assure a good response rate because if you approach people and ask them to fill the survey, you will definitely get a good response rate. It also allows a rapport and trust to be established. You can also motivate the respondents to not only start the survey, but complete the survey, maybe offer them some rewards. Uh, some gift cards and you allow for clarification you know so sometimes if the uh, respondents do not ask or understand your questions or maybe you don't understand their response you can ask for clarification it allows you to prompt them uh, probe them and uh, also read the non-verbal cues so face to face as you would be meeting people uh, you can you know probe them further ask them to you know fill qualitative responses and uh, because you are there you can prompt them you know uh, give them prompts like show them pictures explain the questions using pictures something like that uh, the disadvantage of face-to-face -face services is it can be lengthy and expensive uh, because uh, approaching people individually or even in groups to fill a response to your service can often be tiring time consuming because if you are doing them in groups, it will be difficult for you to monitor it. If you do it individually, it will be time consuming. You also are limited in a geographical range. So face to face surveys, you pretty much have to conduct them within the within your own area, area of comfort. You cannot I mean, otherwise you would have to travel. And these days, of course, with COVID, you cannot travel, but traveling becomes an issue. So face to face surveys uh, will cost you if you are traveling and administering them. Uh, otherwise, you will have to mail them and post them. That would be easier. And uh, of course, it does not assure anonymity or confidentiality because you are face to face with the respondents and the respondents may feel uncomfortable because you are around them and they may not respond as you would uh, like them to respond. They may not respond honestly sometimes because uh, they might feel that you know who's filling the survey and you will be reading their response. And it also requires some kind of training to be conducted properly. So an example of face to face surveys is say you've gone to the mall, shopping mall or a supermarket and you're conducting a survey uh, where you stop someone, ask them if they are ready to answer a series of questions based on what you want to find out. Then you have the telephone surveys. Uh, probably I'm sure you have experienced this as well. They are, of course, uh, relatively inexpensive compared to face to face surveys. And they can allow wide geographic range because you can call up people located in any part of the world. And it offers some assurance of anonymity and confidentiality because you are not really looking at their face. So they are not really uncomfortable with your presence. They are talking to you over the phone, but you are not uh, really. I mean, some kind of anonymity and confidentiality is there. But it also allows for some clarification, prompting, probing, like I mentioned before. So if the respondents do not understand your question or you don't understand the response, you can immediately clarify either or. So an example, of course, is in market research, the telephone tends to be the mode of choice. So I'm sure you have got a number of calls from call centers over a period of time where they sometimes ask you to respond to their questions. 
and uh, that is why the response rate can be very low because people often get annoyed unless you have taken an appointment you have fixed an appointment or there is mutual benefit for both parties involved people don't really want to spend time answering questions over the phone you know they they it's easier for them to just hang up so and sometimes you catch people at a bad time and uh, you know respondents can get bored especially absence of body language absence of rapport um, and they might you know just hang up on you and you are limited to serving only those who have a telephone if they don't have a telephone or you don't have their telephone numbers uh, then you can't ask people questions who do not have telephone finally you have the self administered survey uh, this can include both snail mail what we call is the traditional mail and email now email of course saves you thousands in printing and postage cost but you are limited to serving within the online populations additionally the proliferation of a spam mail means that unless your respondents know you your survey not even get looked at your email may go into the spam folder or the junk folder and uh, you will have to follow up each respondent to ensure that they have received your survey so the response rate also over email can be very low and it does not allow for clarification because the people who are filling up your survey will not actually respond to it they may feel too lazy or can't be bothered you have to keep on prompting them and they might get a bit irritated with that as well it can actually end up being costlier the advantages of this type of survey is that you can offer them confidentiality and anonymity and you can reach out to people from wide geographic ranges so you know emails can be sent anywhere to the world and also provides the respondent some kind of privacy and also opportunity to answer in their own time they are not pressurized by your presence or your uh, you know the fact that you are around them to answer and they can answer freely because you know they are kind of assured confidentiality and anonymity so guys uh, i hope this video was useful to you make sure you think very carefully and have a discussion with your uh, supervisors and advisors as to which type of survey and what method of administration would suit your research the best to get the best response rate and uh, to be able to get the data that you require to answer your research problem and research question thank you for watching today's video and uh, like i always say i like to keep these videos short for my students who otherwise complain that these videos are too long bye for now and i'll see you soon with my next video